Welcome to Chapter Breakdown, a podcast featuring in-depth conversations about literature. My name is Connor, and this is my brother Parker. Hi. In this episode, we will discuss Yasunari Kawabata's 1954 semi-fictional novel, The Master of Go. This book is a meditative recasting of a famous 1938 match of the board game Go, which saw the last master of a centuries-old school of Go, Honimbo Shusai, lose his only competitive match to a young challenger. Kawabata originally covered this match as a reporter in a series of straightforward dispatches, but he returned to the source material after World War II to create a more novelized elegy about the final defeats of a tradition of Go, which stretched back to the beginning of the Tokugawa shogunate. This novel, which Kawabata would later consider his greatest work, encapsulates the delicate interplay of sorrow and cultural longing which provides his prose with its characteristic autumnal breeze. In a 1968 article discussing the aesthetics of sorrow in Kawabata, Reiko Tsukimura argues that, quote, In the works of Kawabata, there is no villain, nothing disastrous, no such enmity or antagonism that results in a calamity. No character created by Kawabata struggles to project himself. Rather, he gives himself up to what comes over him. He seems to give up rational and critical analysis of himself and the situation in which he is put. He recollects his past, which sometimes brightens his life and sometimes leads him to regret and remorse. In the depth of his heart lies his subconscious longing for the eternally beautiful, pure, innocent, and tender. He forgives rather than accuses. Compassion and sympathy rule out bitterness of criticism. He discovers affinities between nature and man and gets consolation in the beauty of nature and art. The impact he gives to the reader is tinged with sorrow and beauty, revealing to the reader the home of the soul and enabling him to extend his sympathetic understanding of the fellow human beings. End quote. In The Master of Go, the hint of the eternal in an art tinged with sorrow is the tradition of spiritual Go which is being superseded by a modern sensibility, which seeks to solve Go at increasingly higher and higher levels of competitive complexity. To understand this older tradition of Go, we need to understand how Go folded into Japanese society. Say, Shonagun, in her Heian period diary of court life, The Pillow Book, writes, quote, It's also amusing to see someone of high standing play Go against a social inferior. He lounges there relaxed, the ties of his robe loosened, casually scooping up the pieces and putting them on the board, while the man of lesser rank sits a little back from the board, maintaining a carefully respectful posture, and when he leans forward to play, he'll politely raise his other hand to draw back the hanging flap of his sleeve. End quote. In this passage, we can see how playing Go becomes a delicate social dance of class, in which a conversational game between two people takes on all of the social tensions that their meeting exhibits. Shonagun's vision of Heian court life, with its incessant recitations from a poetic canon and its meticulously colorful obsession with dress, is a life in which one is constantly manifesting their social position in acts of communicative beauty where attempts to enact cultural ideals constitutes the expected response to any moment. Go fits into this life as yet another stage for these actors to play out the mellifluous harmonies of their role. As the popularity of Go grew during the Kamakura and Miromachi periods, a complex social exchange deepened the role of Go into an integral part of Japanese culture's search for the perfection of forms. When Tokugawa Ieyasu unified Japan at the start of the Edo period, he appointed a monk, Honimbo Sansa, who had previously taught Go to all three great daimyo to become the minister of Go. To regulate the development of Go in Japan, Sansa founded the first of four major Go schools, the Honimbo, which would go on to become the most important Go institution for centuries. Sansa's religious training as a Nichiren monk helped him to conceptualize Go as a bodily inaction of a meditative intention. The Nichiren Buddhists believed that ritual bodily engagement with the material world was a foremost spiritual practice because it demonstrated the unity between the spiritual and the material. Under the guidance of a lineage of Honimbo Go masters, some of whom earned the cherished title of sage, Go transformed from a strategic game into a transcendent ritual which cultivated the inner condition of each player. 
in this guise, Go became a major touchstone of the developing Japanese national identity. Masuo Basho, in one of his highly symbolic travel diaries, in which Japan appears as a dynamic land of memory, where all the great emotive movements of Japanese history and art are entwined with the natural scenes in which they occurred, recalls how he, quote, Pick some pebbles on the beach, the so-called white stones of Irogo, used for games of Go, end quote. In this moment, as in many other moments of Basho's travel diaries, the transcendent cultural performances of the Japanese spirit lie signified by a natural scene, as if the spirit of Go begins here, on a beach, famous for its stones. To play Go in the meditative state of the great Honimbo school, therefore, was a way of entering into the very soul of Japan itself. Thus, a game between the last Honimbo master and a prodigy of the highly competitive Go tournaments, which feed a newly worldwide interest in Go, is fraught with all kinds of delicate cultural tensions. It is these very tensions that fall right in line with Kawabata's sensibilities as an elegist of the intangible. In reading this novel, Parker, how did these sensibilities feel to you? What kinds of sadnesses do you think Kawabata is trying to express? So, yeah, that's a really good setup. And I think Elegy is the right way to frame what the project of the book is. I think the central sadness is the sadness of seeing one era pass and another one rise and inevitably you lose a lot of the symbolic rituals and power that were associated with the old as they're swept away with the beginning of a new era. And there's an inherent sadness to that, and it's framed in a way that's very personal. You see the old master who is frail and who is no longer in good physical condition, still struggling valiantly, trying to die this warrior's death almost, to go out fighting one last time and maybe to forestall the inevitable wave of progress that's overtaking him. And you know at the beginning of the book that he's going to fail. The invincible master who has all of these victories behind him and encapsulates this tradition and this beauty of Go is going to fall before this new and aggressive style of his challenger. There is just an inherent sadness to that. This comes up directly in the book when the master repeatedly falls ill during the months-long game that they're playing. He keeps having to ask for these concessions. He keeps having to change the venue and postpone the matches and change the amount of time allotted for each match because of his health. This is the sadness. You want to see the master at the height of his powers facing off against the challenger also on the rise and at the height of his powers and see which of these is dominant and to see what deserves to happen. It's unfair almost to see an up-and-coming challenger beat up on a frail old man who is trying to get a little bit more time to accommodate his illnesses. But at the same time, it's not a level playing field. If you're going to make all of these concessions to the master's health, then perhaps he can't actually be competing on the grounds that are being pretended. And this almost pushes Otake to conceding the match because he doesn't want to be caught in this impossible position between giving up all of these handicaps that he feels are being asked of him, or on denying them and being held responsible for sending the master to an inglorious end. So he's threatening to quit, and he gets this pep talk from the author's stand-in. He says, quote, I spoke boldly. I said that as challenger in this, the master's last game, he was fighting in single combat, and he was also fighting a larger battle. He was the representative of a new day. He was being carried on by the currents of history. He had been through a year-long tournament to determine who would be the master's last challenger. Kobamatsu and Mieda had been the winners of an earlier elimination tournament among the players of the sixth rank, and they had been joined by Suzuki, Segoe, Kato, and Otake of the 7th rank, in the tournament in which every player met the other. Otake had defeated all five opponents. He defeated two of his own teachers. Suzuki and Kubamatsu 
Suzuki, it was said, would have bitter regrets for the rest of his life. In his prime, he had won more games than he had lost his black against the Masters White, and the Master had avoided the next stage, at which they would play black and white in alternation. Perhaps out of feelings for his old teacher, Otake had wanted to let Suzuki have one last chance at the Master, yet he had sent his teacher to defeat. When he faced Kobumatsu, each of them with four victories, in the decisive match, he was again facing a teacher. One might therefore say that Otake was playing for his two teachers in this contest with the Master. The young Otake was no doubt a better representative of the active forces than were elders like Suzuki and Kobumatsu. His incomparable friend and rival, Wu of the Sixth Rank, would have been an equally appropriate representative, but Wu had five years earlier tried a radical opening against the Master and lost. And even though Wu had won a professional title, he had at the time been of the fifth rank, scarcely an eminence from which to face the Master at no handicap. And so the match had been a different order from this, the Master's last match. Some 12 or 13 years, and some years too before his match with Wu, the Master had been challenged by Karagane of the seventh rank. The contest was really between the Go Association and the rival Kiesha. And though Karagane was among the Master's rivals, he had over the years been the underdog. The Master won another victory, and that was all. And now, the invincible Master was staking his title for the last time. The match had a far different import from those with Karagane and Wu. It was not likely that the problems of succession would arise immediately if Otake were to win, but the retirement match meant the end of an age and the bridge to a new age. There would be a new vitality in the world of Go. To forfeit the match would be to interrupt the flow of history. The responsibility was a heavy one. Was Otake really to let personal feelings and circumstances prevail? Otake had 35 years to go before he reached the master's age, five more than the sum by the oriental count of his years thus far. He had been reared by the association in a day of prosperity, and the master's youthful tribulations were of a different world. The master had carried the principal burden from the beginnings of modern go in the early Meiji through its rise to its recent prosperity. Was not the proper course for his successors to see this match, the last of his long career, to a satisfactory end? End quote. We see here really a recapitulation of what's happening. A new age is overtaking an old one, and this bears a responsibility to the traditions that are being usurped to send them out in a way that's dignified. But given the inherent indignities of old age, this is almost something that can't be done. So I think in long form, the answer of what is the principal sadness of the book, it's in wanting to see the old traditions fight at full strength and not go gently. You see glimpses of that. Master has moments where he's able to recapture his old glory, and he's certainly not weak, but it is tragic to see something that was perfect and honed and crafted over a lifetime fall to the inexorable decay of old age and be taken out in a way that is not as beautiful. To see that crumble under the weight of history is the principal sadness we're being pointed to over the course of this game as it drags out over months. Yeah, the principal difference between these two people is represented in their bearing towards the match. We're seeing in Shusai this meditative version of Go. He has spiritual training versus somebody who may be better, but is approaching it from a very neurotic, competitive angle. And that angle, even though it supersedes in competitive strength, the old style, is losing something. You see the contrast between them emerge in such a way that what is happening is not just the defeat of an old master, but rather the loss of a certain understanding of Go, a certain cultural position of Go, to a new more worldwide and less entrenched in culture version of Go. This can be best represented in how the two players are seated at the board. One is seated in a sort of zazen, very meditative style, whereas Otake is constantly running to the bathroom, he's rocking back and forth, he's drinking tea all the time, he's a little <laughs> bit of a mess, right? Yeah, they have side conversations about his urination habits, you know, yeah, in kind of an like, undignified way. Yeah, he's, he's clearly not somebody who's very composed, he's in some ways 
very miserable. I mean, one of the interesting things about this match is that everybody seems to be very miserable, right? <laughs> it seems yeah. like a hellish ordeal that they're all putting themselves through. They're locked yeah. away in this country right. in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> right? Just yeah. miserable. Right. But compared with the master who was half having a heart attack and only tells them after the fact, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, th I think there's a part right at the start where you see their two styles diverge. Quote, the two opening plays had been ceremonial, and serious play began today. As he deliberated Black Three, Otake fanned himself and folded his hands behind him, and put the fan on his knee like an added support for the hand on which he now rested his chin. And as he deliberated, see, the master's breathing was quicker, his shoulders were heaving, yet there was nothing to suggest disorder. The waves that passed through his shoulders were quite regular. They were to me like a concentration of violence or the doings of some mysterious power that had taken possession of the master. The effect was the stronger for the fact that the master himself seemed unaware of what was happening. Immediately, the violence passed. The master was quiet again. His breathing was normal, though one could not have said at what moment the quiet had come. I wondered if this marked the point of departure, the crossing of the line for the spirit facing battle. I wondered if I was witnessed the workings of the master's soul as all unconsciously it received its inspiration was host to the <laughs> afflatus, or was I watching a passage to enlightenment as the soul threw off all sense of identity and the fires of combat were quenched? Was it what had made the invincible master? At the beginning of the session, Otika had offered formal greetings, after which he had said, I hope you won't mind, sir, if I have to get up from time to time. <laughs> I have the same trouble myself, said the master. I have to get up two and three times every night. It was odd that, despite this apparent understanding, the master seemed to sense none of the nervous tension in Otake. When I'm at work myself, I drink tea incessantly, and I'm forever having to leave my desk, and sometimes I have nervous indigestion as well. Otake's trouble was more extreme. He was unique among competitors at the Grand Spring and Autumn Tournaments. He would drink enormously from the large pot he kept it aside. Wu of the sixth rank, who was at the time one of his more interesting adversaries, also suffered at the go board from nervous enuresis. I have seen him get up ten times and more in the course of four or five hours of play. Though he did not have Otake's addiction to tea, there would all the same, and one marveled at the fact, come sounds from the urinal each time he left the board. With Otake, the difficulty did not stop at enuresis. One noted with curiosity that he would leave his overskirt behind him in the hallway and his obi as well. After six minutes of thought, he played black three, and immediately he said, excuse me please, and got up. He got up again when he played black five. The master had quietly lighted a cigarette from the package in his kimono sleeve. While deliberating black five, Otake put his hands inside his kimono and folded his arms and brought his hands down beside his knees and brushed an invisible speck of dust from the board and turned one of the master's white stones right side up. If the white stones had face and obverse, then the face must be the inner, stripeless side of the clamshell. But a few paid attention to such details. The master would indifferently play his stones with either side up, and Otake would now and again turn one over. The master is so quiet, Otake once said, half-jokingly. The quiet is always tripping me up. I prefer noise. All this quietness wears me down. Otake was much given to jesting when he was at the board. But since the master offered no sign that he even noticed... The effect was somewhat blunted. In a match with the master, Otake was unwontedly meek. Perhaps the dignity with which the real professional faces the board comes with middle age. Perhaps the young have no use for it. In any case, younger players indulge all manner of odd quirks. To me, the strangest was a young player of the fourth rank, who at the grand tournament would open a literary magazine on his knee and read a story while waiting for his adversary to play. When the play had been made, he would look up, deliberate his own play, and, having played, turn nonchalantly to the magazine again. He seemed to be deriding his adversary, and one would not have been surprised had the latter taken umbrage. I heard one day that the young player had shortly afterwards gone insane. Perhaps, given the precarious state of his nerves, he could not tolerate those periods of deliberation. I have heard that Otake of the seventh rank and Wu of the sixth once went to a clairvoyant and asked for advice on how to win. The proper method, said the man, was to lose all awareness of self while awaiting an adversary's play. Some years after this retirement match, and shortly before his own death, 
Onoda of the sixth rank, one of the judges at the retirement match, had a perfect record at the grand tournament and gave evidence of remarkable resources left over. His manner of play was equally remarkable. While awaiting a play, he would sit quietly with his eyes closed. He explained that he was ridding himself of the desire to win. Shortly after the tournament, he went into a hospital and he died without knowing that he had stomach cancer. Kubumasu of the sixth rank, who had been one of Otake's boyhood teachers, also put together an unusual string of victories in the last tournament before his death. Seated at the board, the master and Otake presented a complete contrast. Quiet against constant motion, nervelessness against nervous tension. Once he had sunk himself into a session, the master did not leave the board. A player can often read a great deal into his adversary's manner and expression, but it is said that among professional players, the master alone could read nothing. Yet for all the outward tension, Otake's game was far from nervous. It was a powerful, concentrated game. Given to long deliberation, he habitually ran out of time. As the deadline approached, he would ask the recorder to read off the seconds and in the final minute make a hundred plays and a hundred fifty plays with a surging violence as if to unnerve his opponent. End quote. So I think you see there the essential difference between these two players. One is transcending the game. He exists in a state of meditation. He's sort of renounced himself from the battle and is experiencing his pure being, his pure participation. There's a grandeur and dignity that the master has when he's playing that replies to a specific lineage of temple training that makes Go not just a game, but a way of achieving and experiencing and displaying enlightenment. Whereas Otake is playing this very complex and nervous game. He's constantly moving around. He's always uncomfortable. He's getting up every three or four minutes. There's a difference there that suggests that even though Otake may be playing at a higher competitive level, he's doing so in such a way that he's losing all of that transcendence. Yeah, he's almost degraded by playing the game. He's constantly having to go to the bathroom, like you were saying. He just sweats and ticks. It, But you see that kind of in contrast to the master, who is this frail person who is enlarged by the game, by the warrior spirit that he's bringing. And they say, quote, On another occasion, asked his height, he, the master, said, I was just under five feet when I had my draft examination. Then I grew half an inch and was over five feet. You lose height as you get older. Now it's exactly five feet. He had a body like an undernourished child, said the doctor when the master fell ill at Hakone. There's no flesh at all on his calves. You wonder how he manages to carry himself. I can't prescribe medicine in ordinary doses. I have to give him what a 13 or 14 year old might take. And then immediately after that, that the master seemed to grow larger when he seated himself before the go board had to do, of course, with the power and prestige of his art, the rewards of long training and discipline, uh, end quote. You know, you kind of see there that all the descriptions we have of Otake, he's tactically very strong, but the act of concentration degrades him, whereas the master with this discipline and this tradition and this deep honor is this shrunken, frail man who becomes the invincible master as he sits at the go board, who looks larger, who is able to project strength that he doesn't physically have because he has the strength of his dignity. I think this reflects a changing sense of meaning of the game of Go. This older tradition of Go is a meditative practice which fits into this beautifully ornate and enriched culture of the Edo period schools, indicates a certain degree to which Go isn't just itself, it's another way of accessing this spiritual understanding of culture in the same way that maybe poetry serves. There's a beautiful artistic nature to this game of Go that is being missed because people focus on the master only somebody who's really good at Go. Being good at Go is like the first half of an equation, and you're missing the second half, the more important half, the part that makes you transcend into something else, that turns Go from a game into an artwork. Whereas Otake only has that incessant quality of being good at the game and is focused on that, and in so doing, he loses sight of the real meaning of it. 
And you see this difference in philosophy about the game emerge most strongly at the moment the master loses the game. Because the, it emerges from this sealed play that's a very contentious move, that even though it's the right competitive move, mm -hmm. it is deeply inelegant and it's kind of cheap. So even And though maybe describe uh, what a sealed play is. Yeah, so a sealed play is just at the last person to play in a session seals it so that nobody knows what the next move is going to be. It's just an upkeep practice to ensure that nobody gets an unfair advantage when you break off play for another session. Um, yeah, and so the, the gamesmanship angle that ends up coming up is that Otake is taking advantage of the fact that if you're the player to make the sealed play, you're able to prepare during the days in between matches with knowledge of the move you're going to make. So if you were to make a surprise move, you would have all that extra time to prepare for the responses you would receive, whereas the person who has not made the sealed play is missing that information. Yeah, so... Even the master later on admits that it was a good move. It's very competitive and it makes sense within the logic and theory of how to play the game. But it is completely unresonant with the master's understanding of Go and represents the deep cultural disconnect between these two people playing the same game within notionally the same tradition of playing that game. So there's this passage where it says, quote, I was aware that something unusual had happened, the referring to the sealed play. Whether we somehow followed the master to lunch, or whether he somehow invited us to come with him, I do not know. But we were in his room, and as we sat down, he said in a low but intense voice, The match is over. Mr. Otake ruined it with that sealed play. It was like smearing ink over the picture we had painted. The minute I saw it, I felt like forfeiting the match, like telling him that was the last straw. I really thought I should forfeit. But I hesitated, and that was that. I do not remember whether Yawata was with us, or Goi, or both. In any case, we were silent. He makes a play like that, and why, growled the master. Because he means to use two days to think things over. It's dishonest. We said nothing. We could neither nod assent nor seek to defend Otake. But our sympathies were with the master. I had not been aware at the moment of play that the master was so angry and so disappointed as to consider forfeiting the match. There was no sign of emotion on his face or in his manner as he sat at the board. No one among us sensed distress. We had been watching Yawata, of course, as he was having his troubles with the chart in the sealed play, and we had not looked at the master. Yet the master had played white 1-2-2 two, two in literally no time, less than a minute. It was understandable that we should not have noticed. The minute had not started precisely when Yawata found the sealed play, to be sure. And yet the master had brought himself under control in a very short time and maintained his composure throughout the session. To have these angry words from the master, who had so nonchalantly made his next play, was something of a shock. I felt in them a concentrated essence, the master doing battle from June down into December. The master had put the match together as a work of art. It was as if the work, like into a painting were smeared black the moment of highest tension. That play of black upon white, white upon black, has the intent and takes the forms of creative art. It has in it a flow of the spirit and a harmony as of music. Everything is lost when suddenly a false note is struck, or one party in a duet suddenly launches forth on an eccentric flight of his own. A masterpiece of a game can be ruined by insensitivity to the feelings of an adversary. That Black 121, having been a source of wonder and surprise and doubt and suspicion for us all, its effect in culling the flow and harmony of the game cannot be denied. End quote. So the master is somebody who puts these games together as a work of art. There are a form of experiencing competition with somebody as the push and pull of being, the state of just being as you are. And Creating that is the same way as creating sort of a meditative work of art or some devotional poetry. It's about immersing yourself in that experience. And to make a move that is maybe even competitively right, but which clearly prefers sheer competition over that mutual experience of being, is one that completely eradicates the beauty of the image. It's something that destroys the harmonious spirit of the competition. And that is sort of when the master finally loses track of the game, where it no longer matters to him. He's somebody who's put together a long series of 
great, beautiful works of art in these games. And this should be, in some ways, the capstone of it all. This should be the moment in which he creates his final great work of art. Somebody like Hokusai with a great second wind in their later years. But rather than that happening, he encounters somebody who plays a game to him that feels cheap. That feels like it lacks that necessary spirit which makes the game transcend its form into an art form. And that loss is one that angers him. And yet even when it does anger him, he's so aware of himself at the board that he doesn't actually reveal that anger to anyone. It, nobody notices that he's angry. It's only later that he expresses his disappointment with this ruining of his career's last great masterpiece. These traditions of Go that stretch all the way back into the 17th century. This romantic idea of the schools of Go, and there were three sages of Go from this line. is the greatest line, and almost continued, but here it died with this guy, and this is his final match. It should be the culmination, but instead you get something that's just focused entirely on a match, divorced from all of those cultural experiences. And that's a loss that is not just sort of a retrospective loss, but it's a loss that creates a disconnect that fundamentally ruins the game and causes the burst of anger that the master makes that makes him possibly lose the game. He responds in a very brash move that's almost an act of aggression, and that act of aggression causes him to be in a bad state that doesn't allow him to play for time, which he might have won because Otake almost runs out of time. He's lost the desire for the game because the game has changed from a new era, which is very focused on com competition and the development in the modern world versus this older romantic style that's bound up in the spiritual and which sees these games as works of art. It's sort of the difference we have nowadays with the fact that computers can beat everybody at chess or go or what have you. The idea that you're losing something romantic when human beings are being destroyed by sheer competition and logical processing power. What you really want is the human experience of that. You want to see people and being and life in those games. And when you don't see it, you're losing something that's intrinsic to the nature of what makes us want to play these games. Um, yeah, we, you know, you look for meaning in the narrative surrounding the game more than the algorithmic combinations of possible moves. Seeing some of the grace and narrative being taken out of the game and replaced with gamesmanship of the rules of sealed play that are really there just so you can play over multiple days, but as soon as they're instantiated become yet another way of maximizing the expected value of a play without really recognizing what the game was trying to be. You see two elegies at the end of the book. You get to see the master's health decline and see him physically fail but almost even sadder than that is you get to see the master come to terms with his loss he doesn't just drop dead at the end of the match he dies shortly after but he's able to kind of see the world move on and go develop past the point that he was able or willing to take it and so there's kind of a recap at the end where the Go community is summarizing the game and the master himself comments, quote, Black 121, uh, which was the contentious sealed play, had come as the battle at the center was reaching a climax, and it had been a sealed play. It had angered the master and aroused suspicions in the rest of us. In a difficult situation, a player might, in effect, make a sealed play like Black 121 as a temporary expedient, and until the next session, in this case three days later, give thought to what the last play of the preceding session should in fact have been. I had even heard of players who, at perhaps one of the grand tournaments, would play as if from Ko to the far reaches of the board while the last allotted seconds were being read off, and so prolong life a few seconds more. All manner of devices had been invented to make use of recesses and sealed plays. New rules bring new tactics. It was not perhaps entirely accidental that each of the four sessions since play had been resumed at Edo had been ended with a sealed play on the black side. End quote. I think there, new rules bring new tactics, and you can even see that this entire time, Otake has been the one to make the sealed play. He has been maximizing for that structural advantage in the way the game is being played, and the master has not. The master has been 
playing the game for its intrinsic beauty, which doesn't have to do with the rules of exactly how you're administering it. And you see the master come to terms with this shortly after that, where they say, quote, in his review of the game, the master did not touch upon Black 121. A year later, however, in Selected Pieces on Go from Collected Works of the Master, he spoke out quite openly. Now was the time to make effective use of Black 121. We must note that if he had proceeded at his leisure, which is to say, waited until White had linked diagonally, there's a chance that Black 121 would not suffice. Since Otake's opponent had himself made the admission, little doubt could remain. He was angry at the time because the move was so unexpected. In his anger, he unjustly questioned Otake's motives. Perhaps embarrassed at the want of clarity, the master made a special point of touching upon Black 121. But is it not more likely that in a work published a year after the match and a half year before his death, he remembered the proportions of the controversy and quietly recognized the play for what it was? The master's now was Otake's one of these times. To an amateur like me, something of a puzzle still remained. So you get to see it there. Go is moving on past the era of the master. There is a lot being lost, but in a lot of ways, progress cannot be slowed down. Yeah, this isn't something that's isolated to Go. This is part of a larger cultural experience of Japanese society as it moves towards its fatal project of imperialism in World War II. We can't forget that this is happening during the Second Sino-Japanese War as it leads into Japan's involvement in World War II. We even get the naive first scenes of war with people waving on a train and it seems like an exciting enterprise and people are sad they won't get to see it happen and report on it. There's that nature to which a lot of cultural performance is losing its inner condition of unity and instead becoming obsessed with this competitive nature. And that competition is feeding this cancer of imperialism. And I think you see this most clearly in the way in which the players in the match dismiss Chinese players entirely in a very condescending way. This passage follows after an experience that the narrator recalls about playing an American on a train who knows a little bit of Go. And the American sort of is this foolish figure who doesn't understand Go. He treats it like it's a game of chess, perhaps. And he's constantly just trying to play and play, and he wants to try and learn and win. And he's losing the real intensity of involvement that should be in Go. He doesn't have that commitment to a match that would make it worthwhile. Instead, he's just happy to lose and try again and lose and try again and do this and that. And it doesn't quite mesh. And he seems like a foolish figure of somebody who is obsessed with this game in a way, but at the same time doesn't recognize what actually should happen. His experience is somewhat similar to Japanese society in general, which is in its own way sort of losing that nature of the game. But in a different way, that focus on competition also results in this kind of weird moment where Japanese Go serves as a way to justify a slight superiority over Chinese Weichi, which is their version of Go. And you see this in quotes... Go came to Japan from China. Real Go, however, developed in Japan. The art of Go in China, now and 300 years ago, does not bear comparison with that in Japan. Go was elevated and deepened by the Japanese. Unlike so many other civilized arts brought from China, which developed gloriously in China itself, Go flowered only in Japan. The flowering, of course, came in recent centuries, when Go was under protection of the Edo shogunate, since the game was first imported in Japan a thousand years ago, there were long centuries when its wisdom went uncultivated. The Japanese opened the reserves of that wisdom, the road of the 360 in one, which the Chinese had seen to encompass the principles of nature and the universe of human life, which they had named the diversion of the immortals, a game of abundant spiritual powers. It is clear that in Go, the Japanese spirit has transcended the merely imported and derivative. Perhaps no other nation has developed games as intellectual as Go and Oriental Chess. Perhaps nowhere else in the world would a match be allotted 80 hours extended in three months. Had Go, like the No drama and the tea ceremony, sunk deeper and deeper into the recesses of a strange Japanese tradition? 
Shu Sai, the master, told us at Hakone of his travels in China. His remarks had to do chiefly with whom he had played and where and at what handicap. So I suppose the best players in China would be good amateurs in Japan, I asked, thinking that Chinese go must, after all, be fairly strong. Something of the sort, I should think. They may be a touch weaker, but I should think a strong amateur there would be a match for a strong amateur here. They have no professionals, of course. If their amateurs and ours are about equal, then you might say that they have the makings of professionals. I think they might. They have the potential. But it won't happen overnight. They do have some good players, though, and I gather that they like to play for stakes. They have the material. They must when they can produce someone like Wu. I meant to visit Wu of the sixth rank soon. As the retirement match took shape, much of my interest turned to the shape his commentary was taking. I thought of it as a sort of aid and supplement to my report. That this extraordinary man was born in China and lived in Japan seemed symbolic of a preternatural bounty. His genius had taken life after his remove to Japan. There have been numerous examples over the centuries of persons distinguished in one art or another in a neighboring country and honored in Japan. Wu is an outstanding modern example. It was Japan that nurtured, protected, and ministered to a genius that would have lain dormant in China. The boy had, in fact, been discovered by a Japanese Go player who lived in China for a time. Wu had already studied Japanese writings on Go. It seemed to me that the Chinese Go tradition, older than Japanese, had sent forth a sudden burst of light in this boy. Behind him, a profound source of light lay buried in the mud. Had he not been blessed with the chance to polish his talents from his very early years, they would have lain forever hidden. No doubt in Japan, too, remarkable Go players have remained in obscurity. Such is the way of the fates with human endowments in the individual and in the race. Examples must be legion of wisdom and knowledge that shone forth in the past and faded toward the present, that have been obscured through all the ages and into the present, but will shine forth in the future." End quote. Here I think the Japanese are using the competitive angle of Go, and the master himself is strangely complicit with this as a way of diminishing Chinese Weichi. And this is part of that gross reappropriation of cultural content that an imperialist project necessitates in that it requires these things which are beautiful and are appreciably important developments of that culture. Japanese Go is a very profound tradition which should be honored and should be recognized as something that is indicative of a certain element of the creativity and intensity of Japanese culture. But to use that as a way to create this sort of very dismissive reflection on Chinese Uechi is not only just wrong, but also in a very hypocritical and ironic sense, a cultural misunderstanding. They end up looking kind of like the American who is foolish and didn't understand Japanese Go. They themselves are not really understanding Chinese Weichi. There's a story from the Qing Dynasty area by a guy called Pu Song Ling, who writes a story called the Weichi Devil. And this general is playing Weichi. And this guy, who's sort of like a vagabond, he's very disheveled, he shows up and he wants to play Weichi with them. And he becomes obsessed with the game. He wants to keep playing and playing and playing. And eventually the general's like, no, that's enough. And as soon as the general tries to shut him down, the guy like throws himself at the general's feet and starts complaining that he's like possessed. And it turns out that he was somebody who in life was obsessed with Weichi and he gambled all of the family's fortunes away on it. And so he became possessed by a demon and has to wander the earth forever. And, <laughs> you know, it's sort of this figure of somebody who was driven to madness by, you know, this intensity of passion. And indeed, the moral of the story is the general says, alas, that man's passions could lead somebody to become like this. And so in that sense, the intense focus of this one person on Weichi is considered unhealthy. It's considered to be immoderate. From the Japanese perspective, Weichi may be not sufficiently competitive, sure. But from the Chinese perspective, the obsession with Go is considered to be unhealthy. And indeed, most of the people playing Go seem to be slightly miserable. So you know, <laughs> there might be something true in that. It's not to privilege one perspective over the other, but to say that these games took up different roles in their different cultures. The Chinese culture developed in such a way that Wei Qi found the role that it did. And Japanese culture developed in such a way that Go developed that it did. And they're both 
beautiful in their own respects. And to try and privilege one over the other is to be just like the American who thinks that, oh, wow, I found a cool new game of chess. It just completely misunderstands the cultural context that make the game something more than just a game. Part of the tragedy of the Showa era and World War II is that Japanese culture was repurposed in such a way that a lot of these beautiful traditions were suddenly made competitive and made to be aggrandizing, when in reality they didn't function like that previously, that the competition was in some way ancillary to what was really happening. In the older traditions of Go, which the Honimbo represent, yes, competition is important, and yes, there's a degree to which the master has to be the best player in the land, but historically, the minister of Go is somebody who never has to play a game anymore because if he lost, then he wouldn't be the best player in the game. That sort of defeats his role. So he's sort of like <laughs> exempt from playing, right? He's just sort of assumed to be the best player ever. <laughs> Nobody like challenges him on it. Competition is ancillary. It's part of it, but it's not the whole focus. And by making competition that whole focus is symptomatic of the larger historical movement that's happening as a lot of these beautiful practices are being repurposed for an imperialistic project. Yeah. And one thing I actually wanted to just ask your opinion on was what you actually thought of the way Go is presented in the book. Does it strike you as inherently imperialistic? Did you were able to appreciate it in spite of that? Did you have a better understanding of that? Like, how did you personally view imperialist tones in the book as you were reading it? Well, I think those imperialistic tones are something that have to be acknowledged, and there's a degree to which all of the characters are complicit. I mean, a lot of those really troubling sentences were not only coming from the master, but they were also coming from the narrator stand-in. And I don't know to what degree Ko Obata is trying to create that self-consciously, but what's happening in that historical moment, we have to be aware that this is 1938, mm -hmm. and so it's right as all these things are happening, that Go is being repurposed in that. But I think imperialist repurposing is directly related to the power passing away of the older tradition of Go into the pure competition of, that people like Otake represent. It's not that these are two separate things, but rather they sort of represent the similar movements of the culture. And that Go is not inherently imperialistic, that it, in some ways it's very unimperialistic. There's that one quote that we read earlier about the guy renouncing all desire to win when he plays, right? <laughs> yeah, or the American who's able to perfectly happily play Go and lose over and over and over again for hours. Yeah. You know, he's playing the game, but he's criticized on the meta game dimensions there of not having a warrior spirit. He's playing the wrong way, yeah. but nonetheless, he's playing, you know, there's nothing about the rules of where you're allowed to play stones that precludes him from playing in that way and enjoying himself. I mean, I didn't really know much about Go before reading this book. I certainly gained an appreciation for it. It does seem like a very beautiful game if you research it to such a degree that you're able to follow the inner workings of plays. It's sort of interesting to see the tactical nature of trying to preserve space. What do you think about Go from this book? Yeah, so, you know, I didn't even know all of the rules to Go. I had to look them up. <laughs> I played my first game of Go after trying to read this, and I think it would have been a different experience had I had a deep understanding of the rules and been able to appreciate the diagrams that get provided as the match progresses. But in another way, keeping it at that level of abstraction, I didn't really feel like I lost all that much because a lot of it is in the descriptions of how the characters react and a lot of the book happens in the delays it's not even as much what's happening you get to see the delays in the games the matches drag out the bathroom breaks the inglorious details of this or where I think... This truly brutal game where people are <laughs> stuck in these rural inns. Right? Yeah. And they play, yeah. like, what, every, like, fifth day or something? Like, every right. second day or something it's for, like, and four hours? And you can hours. just <laughs> feel it, where it's like, we played five moves today, and just reading it, you feel the time dragging out. And that was what I thought was the most literarily compelling aspect of the book was actually the way that it dragged, which I know is yeah. a little strange, but you feel the languishing. If you just read the recap of the plays, you would see the last battle warrior's death you were kind of hoping for. But because we get to see behind the scenes and we get to see this slow, disgustingly human evolution of the game it undermines that narrative without having to be quite as explicit about it you get to see both 
the narrative where the game is the final battle of the master and also that he's barely in the physical capacity to do this it's this kabuki thing where he gets to die this warrior's death but you have to wait three months for him to get out of the hospital so that you can (laughs) do it you know yeah well and i think part of how that's accomplished is that the book is relentlessly shifting time it starts here and then goes here and is jumping around the timeline all over that loosening of the time structure helps to construct this feeling of the game folding out as something that is seen from a bunch of different angles and it's not this through play that you get from a linear progression of moves it's rather seeing the different stresses and tensions that are pushing and pulling in different ways and you learn who dies and who loses very early there's no tension there in that way it's all about seeing the characters shift and flow like watching a stream Yeah, and the book felt very modern to me in that way, given when it was written. You you start with the end at the beginning and this undercutting of the main narrative of the game with secondary description of the bodily realities of the players. I don't know what you thought about that, but I was fairly surprised to see that in a book that predates the era where I would have taken that for granted as something. And I was pleasantly surprised by the way the book had a little bit more of a complicated construction than that. What would be your subjective rating of the book? So I would say the things that I liked about it were the way it was constructed. I liked the meditative tone and I liked just knowing more about Go. Things that were a little less compelling to me were there were definitely strains of World War II era nationalism lurking in the book, even if they're a little bit undercut by the way the match ends. You still see a lot of essentializing the character of the races based on the way in which they play Go, and that's just something that you have to take with the time period, but wasn't my favorite part of the book by any means. And at the end, I also feel like there was some depth to the characters, but they were they were somewhat flat in terms of their psychological presentation. So those were maybe the highs and the lows of the book to me. And overall, I would say it was good, but not great. I see why it's well-regarded and the author is well-regarded, but just for my own aesthetic taste was good, not great. Yeah, I mean, to me, when I went into this, this is my first Kawabata book, and I had understanding of the reputation of Kawabata as being very understated. And I was surprised to see that he actually is quite animated in his views. I don't know if that's idiosyncratic to <laughs> yeah. this book, but... With an author insert who gives monologues. Yeah, right? Like, he's... It's sometimes almost <laughs> incredibly denotative and argumentative. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of moments that were sort of quiet. I wondered sometimes if some of the quiet brilliance of the scenes was maybe lost in the translation. I felt like maybe there was supposed to be a little bit more poetic poignance than necessarily came through. But I found the the overall aesthetic project to be important, and I like that the chapters were all very punchy. It definitely felt like, even though the book sometimes repeated itself a little bit ad nauseum, within each constituent part of that book, it did seem like it gets to a point and just delivers it very succinctly. There's a lot to admire about this book, but I would be interested to see if in other books, Kawabata becomes a little bit more of an aesthetic pleasure to read. It's something that I enjoyed because I was personally reading a lot of Japanese literature at the time, but I don't know outside of that context if I would have found it quite as fascinating to me. Well, thank you for listening to the Chapter Breakdown podcast. We'll be back eventually, hopefully, with another (laughs) episode on something or other. Uh, Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.